Yeast cells can be a little mm, particular about what temperature they ferment at, but fermentation isn't the only consideration for temperature control. We've conducted 67 triangle tests to evaluate the impact of yeast storage temperature, yeast starter temperature, and yeast pitch temperature. How does temp affect yeast outside of just fermentation? Let's find out. This episode is sponsored by More Beer. More on them in a bit. My name is Martin Keane, and we've got a bunch of yeast temperature related experiments to take a look at. So let's get started with storage temperature. Now, liquid yeast is best kept cool prior to being pitched, and one reason for that is that lower temperatures reduce the rate at which yeast consume their glycogen reserves. It says so right on the Imperial yeast packaging. Store cold, open cold. Glycogen contributes to stronger cell walls, and so depleted reserves can spell trouble, weak cell walls that are more susceptible to rupturing during fermentation. And when cells pop, the stuff inside ends up in the beer that it was intended to ferment, which can lead to off flavors associated with autolysis. So keep your liquid yeast in the fridge. But you can't always account for the way those yeast packets are treated when they are shipped to you. Now, I recently placed a yeast order just before a public holiday in July, shipping it from the other side of the country. Now, it took a week to arrive, and even though the yeast were shipped with ice packets, those had long since melted, meaning I received some puffed up and lightly pretty stressed out yeast at my door. When I got them, I did toss them in the fridge the moment they arrived, but had the damage already been done? Well, Marshall Schott designed an experiment to test this, to evaluate the differences between beers fermented with yeast that was stored in either cool or warm environments. Marshall brewed two British golden ales, a fine choice if I do say so myself, with the intention of testing the storage temperature sensitivity of an English yeast strain, specifically Imperial Yeast's pub, that's A09. Now, with Brude help from Casey Helwig from Imperial Yeast, the two beers were prepared and transferred into two fermenters. Now, at this point, it was time to introduce the variable, which was a packet of fresh yeast from the fridge and one that had spent two weeks in Marshall's laundry room. Now, for extra authenticity, Marshall gave the pouch of yeast an abusive shake every time he walked by to emulate the bumps that would occur during the shipping process, so props to Marshall for that. And in the yeast went into each fermenter, where the temperature was held at 66 Fahrenheit or 19 C for a couple of weeks. Now, the first opportunity to look for an impact is in the final gravity reading. So was there a difference? No. Both batches recorded an FG of 1.010. The beers were transferred to kegs, carbonated, and came out looking identical as well. It's not looking good for a significant result here. But we went ahead and tested it anyway, so a total of 23 people took our triangle test, where each participant was served two samples of the beer fermented with yeast stored cold and another sample of the beer fermented with yeast stored warm in different coloured cups, then asked to identify the unique sample. A total of 12 tasters would have had to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance, which is exactly how many did, indicating participants in this experiment were able to reliably distinguish the beers. I wasn't expecting that. Now, the 12 participants who made the accurate selection on the triangle test were then asked to complete a brief preference survey. In that survey, a total of three tasters reported preferring the beer made with the yeast stored cold. Eight of them liked the beer made with the yeast stored warm, and one person reported perceiving no difference. So that is a pretty clear win for the warm yeast beer, and I was also not expecting that. Now, in Marshall's own testing, he could also reliably tell the beers apart, and he said it was primarily in the aroma, where the warm stored yeast beer presented a slightly sharper smell. Now, that fortnight in Marshall's laundry room, it didn't seem to hurt the yeast one bit, with both beers showing signs of activity at the same time, they both fermented vigorously, and they both finished at the same FG. So, to my mind, this is testament to the high 200 billion cell yeast count in the packet, where some likely rupturing of the cell walls could be tolerated by still leaving behind enough healthy yeast. Now, incidentally, Marshall did ask Casey from Imperial Yeast for her take on this, and she said that while it's great that the warm stored pub started fermenting around the same time as the properly cold stored pack, they'll be sticking to recommending people store yeast in ideal conditions. Fair enough. But does temperature matter if you're using a yeast starter instead of a packet of yeast? 
Well, before we get to that experiment, a quick word on today's sponsor, More Beer. More Beer's slogan is absolutely everything for beer making, and it's easy to see why, given their selection of over 8,000 products, like the Brewbuilt X3 Uniconical Stainless Steel Fermenter, or the Comos series of kegerators that give you everything you need to get started with dispensing and serving your home brew. And then for quality fermentations, More Beer carries cellar science yeast and nutrients, more Beer offer free shipping on most orders over $59. And also be sure to check out their awesome YouTube channel featuring brewing tips, hijinks, and incredible giveaways. Check out everything More Beer has to offer at morebeer.com. All right, yeast starters. So the idea here is pretty simple. You make a relatively low OG unhopped wort using malt extract, you chill it to room temperature, you pitch the yeast, then you throw it on a stir plate and, well, leave it for a few days. Now, the goal of the starter is to increase yeast cell count, so it's usually recommended to keep the starter somewhat warm, around 70 Fahrenheit or 21 C. Now, that might be a touch warm for some yeast strains, but any off flavors produced will likely be metabolized during the subsequent beer fermentation. Or will they? Might it be safer to spin up the starter in cooler temps? Well, to find out, Brewlosophy contributor Steve Thanos designed an experiment to evaluate the differences between a blonde ale fermented with yeast from a starter that was held at 70 Fahrenheit or 21 C, and one where the starter was held at 50 Fahrenheit or 10 C. Now here's the blonde ale recipe, it's nice and simple, with a tasty looking hop schedule. Now, Steve made two equally sized yeast starters, and he added Imperial Yeast A15 independence to each. He placed one on a stir plate in a spot that maintained a steady 70 Fahrenheit, and then the other was placed on a stir plate in a chamber set to 50 Fahrenheit. Ten hours later, Steve briefly moved the cool starter for a comparison, and noted that the Krausen on the warm starter had larger bubbles, and it seemed to be a bit more active overall, but the cool starter was also chugging along nicely. Now, after two days on stir plates, it was time to brew the blonde ale, and Steve created a beer with an OG of 1060. When the wort was chilled, it was split between two fermenters, and the yeast starters were added. Now, the wort was held at 66 Fahrenheit on 19C for three weeks, at which point final gravity readings were identical. And the beers looked visually similar as well. So just like the last experiment, there were no observable differences, but could tasters tell them apart? Well, a total of 24 people took the triangle test, receiving one sample of the warm starter beer and two samples of the cool sample beer. We needed 13 tasters to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance, but only six did. In Steve's own testing, he could only correctly distinguish the beers once in five attempts, so this didn't seem to make much of a difference. Now, warmer environments are more favorable for yeast replication, so I think it's pretty likely that the warm starter would have had a higher yeast cell count than the cool starter, but it didn't make any observable difference in this beer. That's likely because they were both in the acceptable yeast cell count ranges. So based on this, I'm going to keep making my yeast starters at room temp. All right, so we've looked at storage temperature and we've looked at starter temperature. What about pitch temperature? Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to chill wort to lager temperatures, I can get a bit impatient. Why not just toss the yeast in when the wort is close to room temperature and let it chill the rest of the way on its own time? Well, former philosophy contributor Jake Houlihan tested this out by evaluating the difference between two lager beers split from the same batch where one had the yeast pitched at 48 Fahrenheit or 9C and the other was pitched at 80 Fahrenheit or 27C. And to be clear, both beers would be held at the same temperature of 50 Fahrenheit or 10C during fermentation. So in other words, Jake was putting the, nah, close enough method of yeast pitch to the test. So he brewed a Munich Hellers, and during the wort chilling stage, he waited until the temperature dropped to around 90 Fahrenheit or 32 C, and then he racked off five gallons to a keg fermenter. Then the second part of the batch was chilled all the way down to 48 Fahrenheit or 9 C, and by the time we got to pitching time, the warm pitch batch was at 80 Fahrenheit or 27 C, at which point he added two rehydrated packs of Safflager S23 dry yeast to each fermenter. Both beers were then placed in a fermentation chamber set to the aforementioned 50 Fahrenheit or 10 C, and it took 24 hours for both beers to reach the same 
temperature. So that warm pitch batch was above intended temp for a good while. Now, a few weeks later, hydrometer readings showed that the cool pitch was sitting at 10, 10 FG, and the warm pitch had attenuated a little further to 1.008. A week later, the beers were ready for serving. A total of 20 people took the triangle test, receiving two samples of the cool pitch beer and one sample of the warm pitch. We needed 11 correct selections for statistical significance, and a total of 15 tasters correctly chose the different beer. Another significant result. Now, in the preference survey, the cool pitch beer was preferred by seven tasters, five reported liking the warm pitch beer more, and three had no preference. And Jake, by the way, he was in camp warm pitch. He was saying that to him, the cool pitch beer had a slight hint of sulfur that was absent in the warm pitch beer. He thought the warm pitch beer had more lager-like characteristics than the cold pitch beer as well. So pitch temperature did make a difference here, but with a split decision as to which temperature made the beer better. So that's storage temperature, starter temperature, and pitch temperature. Where do you stand on these three variables? Let me know in the comments. And another temperature variable to consider is sparge temperature. How much difference does that make? Well, you can find out in this video here.